Welcome to the Marlin Fitzwater Center for Communication at Franklin Pierce University in Ringe, New Hampshire. I am Kristen Nevius, Director of the Center, and it is my privilege to welcome you here to the Presidency in the Press, our high school journalism program for New Hampshire students and teachers, and it is supported very generously by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Marlon Fitzwater, for whom the center is named, served President Ronald Reagan and President George H.W. Bush in the White House as press secretary. It is a position that can trace its roots back to Abraham Lincoln. He had a secretary who happened to be uh, a former newspaperman. But as the presidency itself and the nature of the media and the world have all changed, so too has the role of the press secretary. Here to talk with us about the evolution of that role is Bruce Sanka, who served three presidents as spokesperson and communication strategist. After Bruce left the White House, he built a career in public relations, media relations, and corporate marketing. He has been with us for several days, along with veteran CBS Radio White House correspondent Peter Mayer, offering invaluable insight on the nexus of the presidency and the press. Please join me in welcoming Bruce Sanka. Uh, thanks, Dr. Navius. I'm uh, I'm excited and thrilled to be here, and and uh, I'm just uh, just so encouraged by all of you. The interaction that I've had with you these past couple of days and talking about it, it uh, it gives me uh, hope for the future of journalism. I think you're bright students and. And uh, um, I'm sure that, that as you embark on your careers that you're going to be able to uh, tackle some of these big problems that we have today in, uh, in doing it. So uh, as Kristen said, for, for over 35 years, I've been a keen observer of the relationship between the president and the White House staff and the Washington Press Corps. I was a, a political advisor and a member of the White House staff, and I've worked as part of uh, the news media as a senior executive in a publishing organization. I've been a television producer, and it's very clear to me that we've reached a new height, or perhaps I should better say a new low, um, with the rancor and distrust between the president and his staff and the press corps that's responsible for uh, covering his administration. I think there's a lot of blame to go around uh, in all of this. So for the next hour or so, what I'd like to do is bring you through some historical background of how the White House, Prep Rishi, the White House press operation has worked in the past. Uh, I plan on covering how the evolution of technology has contributed to, to the current situation. And then uh, at the end, I'll try to bring you through a typical day of what it might be like at the White House press office. I really don't want this to be a monologue, so I invite you to interrupt and ask questions along the way. And of course, at the end, we'll, uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions as well. So uh, a little bit about my background. I grew up in suburban Chicago, Des Plaines, Illinois, right north of O'Hare Airport. And I came from a family of uh, Republican volunteers. Um, as a college student, I got a call from the local chairman of the Republican Town Committee asking for volunteers to drive in Ronald Reagan's motorcade when he was running for president. And so uh, I got my mom's station wagon washed and I uh, uh, you know, went to O'Hare Airport and met a guy named Bob Athey, who's still a friend of mine today, and uh, ended up driving uh, a man named Michael Deaver, who later became one of Ronald Reagan's chief presidential advisors in a motorcade. And then the next time they came to Chicago, I helped a little bit more. And uh, the time after that, I got invited to work on the, the rally staff and do that. And so eventually, those uh, same people that I met during those activities uh, became members of the White House staff when uh, President Reagan was elected. And then uh, when I finished college at Illinois State University, I... Uh, I went to Washington, and those friends that I had made during that campaign as a volunteer made arrangements for me to interview to get an internship on uh, then Vice President Bush's staff. And I started as an advanced guy, uh, an advanced man. And what that meant is that I went all over the world, um, sometimes to su my first trip was to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and uh, would make the arrangements for when. Vice President Bush would travel someplace. So I worked with the Secret Service and I worked with uh, 
the White House Communications Agency staff, and then the local committee to make the plan for all of that. Now, at college, I had been a communications and journalism student, and so uh, I had also had experience as a radio reporter. I worked as a reporter at an NPR station in uh, central Illinois. And so, uh, so they uh, naturally assigned me to work with the press, and I became a press advance person. And so what that meant was when Vice President Bush was traveling someplace, I would be the person that would be sent out front to deal with the local media, mostly on logistics. Um, you know, where the camera platforms were going to be and how they would get a credential and where they would park and what time they needed to arrive and, and those kind of activities. And uh, I was successful at that. I was really good at that job and I liked working with the news media. I liked answering their questions and I liked being around them. And so over the years, um, I just kind of progressed in all of that and I became uh, a more senior press aide and then uh, later I became the director of Press Advance. When Ronald Reagan and George Bush were... Um, that internship turned into a paying job, and I got hired first on the, the re-election campaign in 1985 when, when Ronald Reagan ran for re-election and, and uh, was successful in that. And then I was always kind of considered a Bush guy, um, but I had other jobs in the U.S. government. I worked for Malcolm Baldridge, the Secretary of Commerce, and planned his uh, overseas trade missions. Um, and then I also spent a time as personal aide to Edwin Meese, the Attorney General of the United States, where I traveled around the country and world being his, uh, being his, uh, I like to say, briefcase toter um, um, and all of that. And then finally, I, I went back to the White House to become an assistant press secretary when George Bush was um, running for president. Now, uh, I, I can tell you that was pretty modest when it started. My responsibilities included um, taking care of the three or four or five reporters and cameramen that traveled on Air Force Two. But over time, as Mr. Bush ran for president, that became a much bigger job. And eventually, we had um, a press charter that went everywhere Mr. Bush went, and it had 150 reporters, photographers, cameramen, um, radio correspondents. I think that's where I met, uh, first met uh, Peter Mayer, who's here with me today from CBS News. Um, and, uh, and I was in charge of that plane. I was responsible with a, a, a partner, a woman named Marie's, Alix Reed Glenn, um, Mattingly now is her name. And, uh, you know, the two of us ran that operation. And I have to tell you, it was the greatest job I ever had. Um, it, was, uh, it was exciting and fulfilling and interesting and adrenaline filled. And, and uh, you know, it was the kind of job where I, I hope all of you can have an experience like this where you felt like you made a difference every day in the job that you were in. And, uh, you know, for me, it was very, very fulfilling. And then uh, the American people elected George Bush president. And um, um, you'll recall that Marlin um, was Ronald Reagan's press secretary, and, and then George Bush asked him to stay on in that. And I was, uh, I was very lucky then that, that uh, President Bush and Marlon asked me to stay as one of Marlon's assistants in the White House press office. And so that's where I got the a real experience in terms of, of uh, learning what went on in the daily operations in the press office. And uh, I'll talk more a little bit about that later, but uh, it, was a, it was a terrific job and, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was very lucky. So. Um, you know, I was uh, responsible for the care and feeding of those 150 reporters, photographers, cameramen, and producers that travel with George Bush all over the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, running the lower press office was just a great experience. I'll get more into the details of the day-to-day -day operation of, of that later on. So uh, after the Bush administration, I stayed for the first three years of the Bush presidency. And then, uh, and then my daughter Katie was born. And um, I needed to leave government service to make more money because my mom, my, my wife wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And uh, so I, I left the Bush administration, and for a time I worked for a PR firm in Washington. Later I had my own PR firm. And then one of my clients hired me to go inside with them, and I went to work for U.S. Uh, News and World Report magazine where I was a director of communications. Uh, U.S. News is owned by a man named Z Mort Zuckerman, or was then owned by he still owns it now, Mort Zuckerman. But he also had the New York Daily News, uh, Fast Company Magazine, and the Atlantic Monthly. And uh, I ended up uh, helping run the PR operations at all of those um, over time. So, so uh, you know, it was just a great experience. And my experience at the White House set me up very well 
for a successful career in politics. After magazine publishing, I went into the internet business. I worked at a company called GeoCities where I was uh, um, uh, vice president of public relations and then um, stayed uh, in the internet business for, uh, for almost 20 years, working at Official Payments Corporation. And then the last 10 years, I was a chief marketing officer at a company called Bankrate.com. They were all terrific experiences. And I think the training that I got working first as a journalist and then later on as a press secretary set me up for a very successful um, career in business. Um, I, I also tell you that, that uh, I was able to see some just incredible things, you know, just to tick off some things. During the time in, in politics, uh, I've been in three private meetings with the Pope. I've uh, been inside the Kremlin, inside number 10 Downing Street in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. I've uh, spent an overnight in the desert of Saudi Arabia with uh, troops in Operation uh, uh, Desert Shield. Uh, been with the president at Thanksgiving when he visited, uh, visited the troops. Uh, later on, uh, I did consulting work for the 43rd president, uh, George W. Bush, and there I uh, helped arrange his first uh, meeting with Vladimir Putin in Ljubljana, Slovenia. I did the media operations there. I ran the media um, operations at the G8 summit in Sea Island, Georgia, and was with uh, President George W. Bush um, two days after the 9-11 attack at Ground Zero. And so I've, I've had a, a very exciting and interesting and, and uh, you know, uh, window on things that have happened in the world that I feel really uh, uh, privileged to, to have been in. I want to make one comment about the reporters and producers and correspondence that I worked with over the time. Um, I, I can tell you that, that uh, I was often in adversarial positions with these reporters. I was on the other side of an issue, but I never considered them the enemy. Um, you know, I think that they're some of the finest people that I've ever met. And, you know, something I'd like all of the, the people here and maybe people watching on the web to understand in that is that to, to become a White House correspondent or photographer or camera person means that, that you're at the very top of your craft. You've had the greatest experience and it's the, the pinnacle of a job um, in, in doing it. And the people that that have uh, you know risen to these positions are quality individuals. And so that's part of the reason I think it's just so kind of disconcerting to see what's happening in Washington right now between the, the trust and that. So I was uh, uh, on the other side of the aisle, or, or the other side of uh, the microphone, I should say, but I never considered them the enemy because I think the, the reporters have uh, an essential role in, um, you know, the political process, and I think they're part of the American fabric. And uh, so... So I, I thought what I would do in setting this stage is kind of look at the historical role of the press secretary um, and then go into some of the, the, the things that I think have affected what the relationships are these days, particularly technology that I think has made a difference in all of this, and then uh, go through the, the workings of the press office, uh, you know, how a typical day may be at the White House and on the road uh, works for all that. So. When I was coming up, a good press secretary, an effective press aide, would have several masters. Of course, the, the boss and the principal master was the president. Um, you know, but to do a good job, I think you also had to work on behalf of the White House staff and also the press corps. That last part might come as a surprise to you. I considered myself a resource and advocate for the press corps. I helped them get the information they needed to do their job. I listened to their questions, what they were asking. I also saw part of my role, since I spent so much time with reporters, as, um, I don't want to say intelligence, but I was kind of an early warning. Because I spent so much time in filing centers, in motorcades, waiting for the president, being around them, waiting for photo opportunities or photo sprays to begin, doing those kind of activities, I listened to what was going on and I could tell I would go back to my bosses and predict what was going to be in the newspaper the next day or what the questions might be coming up and, and, uh, and taking a look at that. And I think that might be something that's lost today on the press aides because there's such a, an apparent adversarial 
uh, relationships. So I said it's, di it's, it's dis disconcerting to me to routinely hear journalists referred to as the en enemy. I, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this term, the fourth estate. It's derived from the traditional European concept of the three estates of the realm, the clergy, the nobility, and commoners. In United States English, the fourth estates used to emphasize the independence of the media and the press. Uh, I think the media, or the fourth estate as described, is an important and essential element of our American system. An independent press keeps us forthright and honest and is doing due diligence on behalf of the American people, and so I believe. So uh, I might have considered the, the news media an adversary, but I never considered them the, the enemy. I respected their role in the American political process, and I know Marlon Fitzwater and our mutual boss, George Bush, um, thought that that was the case, too. Um, I mostly work for, for George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president of the United States, and I can tell you to a certainty that he respected the role in the media political process. And he required all of us who worked in the news media to treat with them um, with uh, respect and professionalism uh, with due. I can only assume that the current White House press staff um, has an attitude for the media that's driven from the top, and, and their attitudes are reflected by the attitude and impressions of President Trump. We've certainly heard his public comments in the campaign and lately about you know, how he feels of the news media. He's even referred to them as the American enemy of the American people. And I just, you know, uh, I reject that notion. I, uh, I, just, uh, I just don't think in the case. I can tell you a little, uh, a little story to, uh, to tell you how the president. So in, in 1987 or 1988, Newsweek magazine did a very, very provocative cover where they called um, on the cover, they put a picture of, of uh, then Vice President Bush and, and referred to him as a wimp, and they put a question mark on that. And we were all, you know, we were all disappointed and angry and, and, and offended on that. And, uh, and I can tell you that it was, uh, it was a high-tension time. We thought it was over the top. And, and when I say we, I, I mean the staff members and all of that taught about it. And one day we were in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and one of the jobs that I had was loading the press corps in the motorcade. And, and it so happened that there was a, a correspondent for Newsweek magazine that was traveling with us right after that time. And it came time for the motorcade to depart, and I had a walkie-talkie in my ear, and the, the, the head of the advance office would call and say, you know, Zank, are you ready to lo and loaded to go? And the one reporter that was dawdling was this Newsweek reporter. And I decided to kind of put it to her. And I pulled out the motorcade and I left her. And uh, I, I can just tell you, I got in so much trouble from George and Barbara Bush um, after that taken. I was called into a, a, a holding room and I was told what for. And that's just not the way they do because it wasn't uh, well-mannered and it doesn't matter what somebody wrote and how offended we were by it. And I know the Bushes were uh, upset about what was written and what said but they wouldn't stand for one of their staff members to, you know, treat that reporter improperly. So, you know, I, I think that that's a standard that uh, has probably fallen away, uh, you know, in, in recent time. Uh, I think sometimes we, we, uh, we probably could use a dose of, uh, of that uh, good manners and, and, uh, and, and cordial attitude, uh, you know, in, in the future. So. You know, don't get me wrong, more times than not, I was on the other side of issues with many of the reporters that I interacted with. But what I'm talking about is um, a respect and appreciation for their integral role in the process of government. This also involves understanding the roles, goals, and needs of various members of the White House Press Corps. I always specialized in uh, one of my specialties was helping photographers. Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen it at presidential events or maybe even on Capitol Hill. The photographers are all down in front of the, the podium, and one of my jobs was to escort them as a young press aide to go ahead and do that. And I, I learned so much from these veteran journalists about creating the who, what, why, where, and when of a story in a single moment. And what I came to learn was if I could help them create an interesting image it would make it so it was in the newspaper because what I did was understood the editorial process as a, as a press aide 
and knew that they would take their, what they referred to as their take, their photographs, they would send them to their editors, the editors would look for an interesting picture, and if we saw the same picture of someone at a podium in the middle uh, that they've seen a hundred times and it didn't differentiate between any of the other uh, hundreds of photos that came out on a campaign trip or a presidential stop, that it wasn't likely to get in the newspaper because it wasn't interesting. But if I could provide a different angle, show maybe the audience, show a face or the reaction, that it would do. So I would work with those photographers um, uh, who President Bush, I can tell you, had a real uh, personal um, uh, affinity for. He liked being around them. He, he lovingly referred to them as the photo dogs. And that wasn't an insult. They wore that as a badge of pride. And I can tell you, on more than one occasion, um, you know, we would get to a hotel for the night and President Bush would take the photo dogs, um, much to the chagrin of the, the, the written correspondence, you know, out for barbecue or out for that. He'd spend time with them. He'd play horseshoes with them. He'd be around them because he had an appreciation for how hard they worked and, uh, and the job they did. So, so my job was to get them the angles and access they wanted to achieve their goal. The more interesting the photo, the more interesting the coverage, and the more coverage the president would get. That would be the case for reporters as well. For a radio reporter to do an effective job, and uh, Peter Mayer here is one of the best of them, they have to have uh, a sound, a natural sound, uh, to give the texture of the event and, and what happened. Uh, a clean audio feed of the president's remarks was also essential to that. Um, in, in doing it. A print reporter not only needed to understand and report on the president's marks, but also needed to be able to report on the texture and energy in an event. And I think too often these days of the press aid is more about containing and limiting access to the press corps than uh, facilitating the job. So uh, that's, that's kind of my philosophy is, is, is press interaction. Uh, and just to recap, I think effective press aid does the job for the president, but also should do the job for uh, the press corps as an advocate for them and to do their job. The president is their main master and they can't do anything at the president's expense, expense on behalf of the press corps, but certainly uh, you know, to do a good job for their president. I always thought that a happy press corps, to the extent that you could do it, would mean for a happy uh, story. And that meant getting them the access they need, finding them a bathroom when they needed it, um, you know, uh, making sure that they got fed, that they weren't abused by, by uh, you know, uh, uh, local police or, or, uh, or officials or even, you know, the crowd. So uh, I think what we should do is take a look at how the news media has changed and, and look back at, at the last, uh, you know, 30 years or so in terms of, of what's happening. So in the early 80s when I was coming up as a press aide for – News for a news item to be covered, the event really had to take place by three o'clock Eastern time. You see, uh, uh, back in those days when I first started, we many television, particularly local television stations, um, still shot the news on 16 millimeter film cameras. And so imagine, you know, for the event to take place, they would have to shoot the event process the film, get it back to the station, edit that, and get that on. For the national news media, they had video, but they didn't have reliable transmission facilities where they were. So, uh, you know, if you were in Iowa, sometimes you had to get the tape to Des Moines so it could be fed to Washington, or even Chicago to be fed to, to Washington. You know, uh, um, I, I remember in the late 80s, um, many of the television networks had to go from here in New Hampshire to Boston to feed their videotape for an evening newscast. And so one of the things that that did was, and, and it was the same case for the reporters, you know, we didn't, when I started, we didn't even have fax machines. You know, think about that for a second. Every one of you has a smartphone and you can talk to anybody in the world in two minutes, you know, right from your phone, but we didn't have fax machines. Uh, the computers that they had we didn't, we didn't have cell phones. The computers that they had were made by Tandy Corporation, Radio Shack, and they were called TRS-80s. And, and your third generation cell phone is much more powerful than that, but it had acoustic couplers on it. You would take the telephone, the landline, and you would put it in these, these two little cups, and that's how they would make it. So everywhere that the press 
had to file to make their stories, we had to install 25 telephone lines. And so days ahead of time, we would find a high school gymnasium or a church back room, and we would call that a filing center, and, and, uh, and we would replace it and, and do that. And, um, you know, it made the logistical handling of the press, you know, very, very difficult. And as I said, if it didn't happen by about, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it wasn't, it wasn't really uh, newsworthy. So if you look into the 90s, um, you had the advent of, uh, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, CNN came into uh, fashion. And that uh, truncated the news cycle. There wasn't a 24-hour news cycle anymore. There was always a deadline. Now, now, I'm looking at Peter in the back of the room. I can tell you somebody like him always had a deadline because he was filing five times a day for hourly newscasts in doing that, and the wire services always had deadlines before that. But by and large, by and large, most of the news media had a day to take a look at that. But when CNN came on, on and then later Fox News came on, it put um, another cycle of pressure on, and the news cycle became shorter in all of that. And I think one of the things that happened with that shorter news cycle is it... Um, shorten the reaction time that press secretaries, White House staffs, and campaign officials could have to think about and react to a story in a thoughtful basis. And so if they knew that they had 24 hours to react on a story, they could maybe uh, tamp down a, 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 a bad line of a story or a bad lead of a story. They could correct misinformation. They could be thoughtful on what they want. They could line up third-party advocates or other spokespersons to talk about what the activities were and, and, and take those kind of things. Um, today, we don't have that opportunity, and everything is, is, uh, is uh, kind of shoot from the hips, or as uh, your earlier session said, shoot from the lips. I like to think it as, as it, uh, it's uh, kind of uh, done a ready, fire, aim mentality. Um, you know, it doesn't give for a chance for thoughtful message development and reaction and the development of what we would call guidance um, to do these kind of activities. And so it's made for a much more uh, speedy, hectic, frenetic process in reacting to that. And I think one of the things that suffered from it is thoughtfulness. Uh, that there's not a real opportunity to that. Now, uh, as I said, during the 90s, CNN and then later Fox News came in. The reporters were always on deadline, and they put great, great pressure on the press office staff on it to, to react to things on a timely basis. These constant deadlines and inquiry increase the animosity and pressure between press secretaries and the, the journalists. There's also one other factor that I think was interesting in the 90s. Most major newspapers started to have web editions in the 90s. And so where in the old days, um, you know, if they didn't make the early paper deadlines, you know, noon for afternoon papers or six or seven o'clock at night for morning papers, they would hold the story until the next day. But now since they had the increased pressure from, from uh, particularly the cable outlets and wire services, if there was an opportunity to break a story, they could do it and publish it on their website before the editions came out. And so the the newspaper journalists and the magazine journalists kind of jumped on the bandwagon, uh, so to speak, in being a, a kind of a rush to publish. Um, the competitive pressure of a television story that was once held in the next day could now be published on a website, and uh, they wouldn't be scooped by a broadcaster. So in this century, I think one of the big contributing factors has been um, the social media. You know, uh, I think that there's a, it's a two-edged sword. Almost every media organization encouraged theirs, their reporters to have a social media presence. I was an executive at U.S. News & World Report for years, and then later at Bankrate.com that has 30 journalists that work for us. And we used to uh, uh, you know, take a look at, at uh, the reporters' social media presence, and it was one of the things that was considered in their evaluations when they did that. It was a requirement of the job to have... Uh, an active social media presence in, in all of that. And so it's put a pressure for them to, um, you know, contribute. I know that many news organizations monitor the amount of followers their personnel have on social media sites. And so, therefore, there's a, 
uh, a lot of pressure for journalists to use the social media tools verbosely. For politicians like uh, the President Trump, you know, he's, uh, he's used Twitter extensively, and it's an opportunity for them to what I call disintermediate the news media. You know, uh, there's uh, a chance for him to go factory direct to consumers without the filter of media reporting on, on, on what he is. And particularly, you know, Sean Spicer has said that, you know, presidential tweets in 140 characters are presidential statements and have the, the you know, the force and fact of a, of, a, of a presidential statement. And so the news media has to take them seriously. And, uh, you know, often it's done without that kind of... Uh, uh, a filter. I, I don't think that uh, that uh, the care and thought, at least apparently the care and thought that's given in a presidential statement that might be released by a press secretary, um, you know, that the same kind of consideration is given to uh, uh, a tweet in uh, in that. So um, I also say uh, about the impact of social media. I believe that the lasting impact of social media is having on political discourse has become very personal. The nature of Twitter and other social media tools is immediate. The veracity and speed at which it's used doesn't lend itself to thoughtful thinking about consequences. And as I said, it's personal. The president's an expert at making issues personal. And I think the reporters are human and react in personal terms. You know, I, I think it'd be very difficult for a reporter these days to be fair, balanced, unbiased when they're being called a liar not to have that cloud their thinking. Um, and I'm not sure how to, how to solve that, you know. If, uh, you know, if somebody pokes me in the eye, I'm going to, my first reaction is going to be to poke them back. And um, I, I'm not sure that that serves the public well in all of that. Um, you know, I, I think everybody could uh, do well by taking a step back from this behavior in, in the future. So... Uh, you know, the other thing I would say about social media is I worked at U.S. News and World Report. I worked at the New York Daily News. I can tell you that there was a process in place over time to vet what was being said. You know, a reporter would write something. They would send it to their assistant managing editor, their desk editor. Their desk editor would review it. If there was a question about that, they would call back and verify what happened in it. They almost always, uh, at the news magazine, we had fact, a staff of fact checkers that would call and check on the statistics and the color, and they would double check all of those facts. In the, the speedy days of Twitter, that's not being done anymore. And so I think, uh, um, you know, accuracy um, sometimes falls on the floor in all of that. And, you know, there's not a second chance to kind of get those things back and being thoughtful where an editor in the old days might have said, are you sure you want to say that? Or is there another way that we might be able to approach it? Nowadays, what happens is, is you know, you're uh, riding, down the, uh, riding down the road in a motorcade or on the subway or in the back of a taxi, and you send your 140-character missive, and uh, it's gone forever, and you can't get it back. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the daily press briefing. You know, we've talked a lot about that. And, uh, you know, since the beginning of the Trump administration, there's been so much drama about the, the, the daily press briefing. You know, Press Secretary Spicer uh, used his first briefing right after the inaugural to kind of set a tone. The first thing that he did was criticize the inaugural coverage of the Washington Press Reporter and use that as an opportunity to kind of... of uh, you know, take them to task about about what the coverage was in doing that, and and I, I think it uh, I think it set a tone. Um, it might be a useful exercise to review the history of the White House press briefing just to talk about it. So when Marlon Fitzwater was Ronald Reagan's press secretary, the White House press briefing was uh, allowed the the first five minutes were allowed for camera, and that was without sound. And, and and then it became a background briefing. We talked in our session about rules of engagement of what happened. And so what that allowed was the television networks to have a picture of Marlon at the podium talking about it. And then the voiceover of their pieces would say, and the White House press secretary said today, or White House official said today, and then go ahead and, and, and report that. After the cameras were turned off, 
um, Marlon actually would leave the room and then would come back in and it would become a background briefing. And what that allowed for was a, a give and take. Um, mind you, they still, the White House stenographers still recorded those background briefings. The notes were distributed to everyone, but it was uh, a ground rule that was set that, that led for an interaction. The other thing that didn't happen in that regard is, is the reporters weren't the story in all of that. Now that was chiefly the way it was done through the, the, the George uh, H.W. Bush presidency. But then when Bill Clinton became president, there was a decision made to make the White House briefings um, on camera uh, and on the record. And that changed forever the nature of the White House briefing because then all of a sudden it became a television event. And, um, you know, the reporters started wearing their coats. The cutaway cameras, uh, you know, were, uh, were off to the side getting the reaction shots. Um, it created a, a, a tension. Um, I also think that the press spokespersons in those days would be reticent to say, I don't know about that, or let me get back to you on that, or um, I'll, have to, I'll have to run that down and get back to you. They still say that sometimes, but for the most part, they didn't want to, I think, feel ill-informed in front of the camera and what happened, and it, it, it I think, lent itself to a kind of uh, a tension and combative uh, relationship between the, the press. Not to say that the, the, the earlier administrations had friendly relationships. Those were combative as well, but it uh, raised it to a new level of being on camera, on stakes, and, uh, and what it is. So uh, the political theater of live press briefings. Press secretaries were hesitant to look ill-prepared. Moreover, I think the reporters saw the briefing as their big opportunity and sometimes played gotcha uh, to make a name for themselves during the briefing, and the whole dynamic made for a much more um, adversarial relationship. So um, I think now what I can do is, do we have any questions so far in, in all of that? Or we can go on. And the next thing I want to do is, is kind of turn to uh, this little org chart that I made up on my computer in Ludlow, Vermont. Um, I, I'll tell you, I tried to get an organization chart of the current White House press office. I called and asked for it, and I couldn't get my uh, uh, phone calls returned in a timely basis. I actually got a call back this morning about it, but, but, uh, but didn't have. So this is something that, that I want, want to do. So you know, I purposely put the President of the United States at the top of the press office. Certainly the President doesn't work in the press office. But what the President does is set the tone um, set the tone of the relationship and how it's it's being answered. You know, I don't know Sean Spicer personally. I have some friends that know him. Uh, I know some reporters that worked with him when he was at the RNC. And by all accounts, he is a, uh, a good guy and a skilled press secretary and a nice man. I'm sure he loves his family, you know, and, uh, and, and does a great job. I think he has an impossible job because he has a very difficult client. You know, one of the things that, that I think Marlon Fitzwater and others that worked for President Bush and President Reagan could count on was if we went out front and said something that the president, we could count on the president kind of standing by our, our, our words. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Press Secretary Spicer, you know, has had to walk the plank several times in terms of, of uh, you know, not having that kind of support from the top. and. And just as an observer, a keen observer looking out, I, I think it's interesting. So, so then you have the, uh, the White House press secretary, all right? And then there are uh, a kind of two divisions, um, the, uh, the upper press office and the lower press office. Could you change the slide? Thanks, Isaiah. So this, is, uh, uh, you know, this isn't classified or anything. I downloaded this from the National Park Service website. This is a schematic of the West Wing of the White House. I just want to give you, you know, uh, uh, a little bit of the lay of the land. So if you look right here where the red dot is, that's the press secretary's office. You've heard other people refer to it. There's a big kind of curved desk in there. Um, you know, along the wall, there was a bank of televisions. Uh, Marlon used to, used to sit there. His deputy press secretaries, the principal deputy press secretaries, would be in these two offices here, and he had an admin assistant here. I'm told it's chiefly the same up in the White House. And this is right across the hallway from the cabinet room and across the hall from the Oval Office. 
if you were to go down this corridor and around the outside of the cabinet room towards the colonnade and uh, the mansion of the White House, there is the press briefing room. And so this is the upper press office and this is the lower press office. The press briefing room that you typically see, that's the, the room with the podium where the press secretary briefs is right there. And then the press corps has their theater style seats in here and television cameras at the back. And then there's, uh, there's uh, press corps offices and all of there. On the, on the lower level of this press corps offices is uh, where most of the radio correspondents sit and where Peter spent you know, years of his life, I think, um, um, uh, in terms of that. And so, so when I refer to as the upper press office, uh, that's this area here and the lower press office. This one right here, number 12, that was my office. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, go ahead. Well, um, you know, the 18 acres of the White House, that's how big the plot of land that the, that the White House and the old executive office building is. It's got a perimeter security fence on it. And everyone who works at the White House gets a, a, a credential, a pass, that they have to wear around their neck. And there are different um, levels of security. So um, uh, the press has identified as press. A White House staff member, um, you know, might have a, a White House staff pass. You know, there were different levels. Someone who worked in the old executive office building across the, the parking lot over, over to the, the left of where the vice president's office in the West Wing is. Uh, that's the big building that's across the parking lot across West Executive would have a, another plan. And so, you know, there are hundreds of journalists that are accredited to the White House that have daily passes, and they go there every day. There's probably... I don't know how many. My guess is about 25 or 30 that come to the White House every day to work there in, in the bureaus. And then there are many reporters that are credentialed and have passes and come for events. Then there's also journalists that can get daily passes. So it might be a regional reporter or a trade press reporter that's coming for a specific, um, you know, is it a specific event or something like that. Every one of the people that has a permanent press or permanent pass, either a staff pass or that, goes through a background investigation. You know, they have to submit paperwork and the Secret Service does an investigation and they make sure that they're, they're not that. They have to pass through metal detectors when they come inside and their bags go through an x-ray machine, um, you know, and doing it. So I, I would say that the, the, the security is quite tight. Um, you know, even staff members have to be checked every time that they go in and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great deal of security. They give extra scrutiny to, um, you know, uh, sometimes there's a state visit or something like that, and there would be a group of foreign press that's coming in, and they check all of their equipment. They might have to put that out on the lawn, and a, a bomb-sniffing dog goes back and forth over the top of the press, and they check all of those things. And so, you know, notwithstanding some of the tough press coverage that the Secret Service has, I can tell you that they do a, uh, a, a pretty effective and, and uh, a thorough job of, of protecting the president, and I also, you know, mind you, say, uh, you know, protecting the the people that work there as well. You know, I'll never forget talking to my friends that worked at the White House during 9/11, when there was an airliner that was, you know, headed for the White House, and the Secret Service told people to run for their lives. Um, you know, it was a, you know, uh, it was a hearing over. Were you there that day, Peter? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I'm 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 uh, I'm sure you remember it. It's you know pretty scary, um, in terms of that. So, so uh, uh, we can go back to that other slide, Isaiah. Okay. So, so as I said, there's the there's the uh, the the White House press secretary, his his uh, upper press office, which is are his, uh, you know, uh, the deputy press secretaries who are who are the next level and all of that. Those are usually uh, spokespersons that that uh, you know, talk on a variety of areas. In the Trump administration, uh, Sarah Huckabee is the principal deputy press secretary. I don't know the, uh, the other ones. She sometimes briefs in ter terms of that. In the lower press office, you have the assistant press secretary and staff members. Um, these are the folks that, uh, I was an assistant press secretary in the Bush administration. And, and uh, you know, these are the people that run the daily press coverage of the White House. They distribute documents on behalf of the president. They organize the the press pools, they do the photo sprays, the Oval Office events, 
the cabinet meetings, um, East Room events. Um, they organize all of those. They uh, uh, do the pool rotations and uh, serve as the day-to-day -day interface between the reporters and uh, other credentialed news media that's there and that. Then uh, adjunct to the White House press office is the NSC press office. So uh, um, when I worked at the White House, there was a uh, um, you know, a couple, there's a, there's a foreign service officer uh, named Roman Papa Duke and, uh, and a Navy officer named Bill Harlow and other folks that worked in that. They were actually on the national security staff, but they specialized in interacting on press matters involving foreign policy, uh, security, and intelligence matters. And then uh, I added, not something that we had back then, but now there's also a social media office at the White House that, that, uh, that does their, their uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, the White House website, you know, the distribution, and and all of these activities. You know, uh, uh, we made some handouts that we can give out afterwards of this diagram for you to have for your your future. Now, this this other chart down here, I, I show that it's not connected. OEOB, that's Old Executive Office. This is what I call support offices. These are our offices that also kind of report on a, many times a dotted line to the president or to the, the, the press secretary or the press office, but, uh, but uh, you know, might actually report to another White House office and all of that. So there's the Media Affairs Office, which are our press officers. They're, you know, press secretaries, and some of them are spokespersons, but they chiefly deal with regional news media, um, trade press, um, specialty press, and those kind of activities. So, um, you know, if a, if a, a reporter from, uh, say, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Daily Herald in Chicago that isn't um, credentialed to the White House but has an inquiry about something that's going on, their point of contact might be with a media affairs reporter. They also handle a lot of the, the press on operations when the president is traveling. The White House Travel Office um, is a uh, is a travel agency that's that's inside the, the the White House that helps make a lot of the travel arrangements and also helps organize the filing centers for the news media when the president is traveling. The Travel Office made a lot of news um, in the Clinton White House when Bill Clinton became president. They decided that they uh, they wanted to. Uh, close the travel office and outsource it to uh, uh, a group in Little Rock, Arkansas that were friends of the president. And uh, there were accusations of malfeasance by the press office staff, I mean, sorry, the travel office staff. And I just want to go on the record and say that was a travesty. The people that worked in that office were as honest as the day is long. You can ask any reporter that's worked in Washington about them doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a good job. Um, in the end, they were all vindicated and, and talked about, but uh, and they they were brought back to the White House. But it was a very very tough time for some some great guys that worked in that White House. There's a group of White House stenographers. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm not positive they're still there, but I think they are. These were um, uh, men and women that went to every presidential event and utterance and made a recording of that, and then produced in a timely fashion a transcript that was distributed to the news media about what the president said. Often when the president's gonna make remarks, the remarks are distributed first in a, a draft form, and then later on a transcript as delivered is made to the news media so that if you go on the White House um, uh, website, you can get a transcript of kind of every presidential utterance that's, that's done. Then there's a press advance office. That's where I started on the vice president's press advance office. These are, are guys that actually work for the advance office, but they go out into the field uh, you know, particularly on foreign trips, but also domestically to make the, the press arrangements for the traveling White House press corps, but they also make the arrangements for the local press in that. And then there's two other things. There's a White House TV unit and the White House photographers. They're both official photographers of the president. The White House TV unit is part of the White House Communications Agency, which is a multi-branch military organization that supports the presidents in uh, all things audio, visual, radios, and telephones and communication and the White House staff photographers. The, most presidents have a staff of four or five photographers. The first lady has a photographer. Uh, George Bush's longtime photographer was Dave Valdez, who's a dear personal friend of mine who uh, spoke last year at the Fitzwater Center and uh, 
his pictures adorn the hallways around here if you go ahead and take a look at and he's uh you know one of the great uh, photographers of uh of all time and a, and a great friend of mine so this gives you an understanding just these offices here represent about 30 people you know my guess in these other offices that's probably another 100 people that are you know actively involved in the administration and care feeding of the news media and uh and uh and and what's what's done of it so uh i'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on the uh on the uh, the uh, lower press office, because that's where kind of, you know, I did uh, a lot of my work. One of the big responsibilities of the lower press office is to organize the the press pools. Do you guys know what a pool is? So so, so let me uh, let, let me explain. Uh, a press pool is a represent, I think Peter covered some of this. A press pool is a representative group of the whole. Quite often, the size of a room or the nature of an event doesn't allow for the entire press corps to have what's called open press coverage. And so there is a, a hierarchy or a schema, if you will, that takes a representative group of journalists and they are responsible for reporting the news of the presidential event on, uh, to, the, to the group of the whole. And the organization of the pools is done on a rotation basis, organized by the, uh, the lower press office staff in conjunction with the White House Correspondents Association. So, so uh, you know, a typical, a typical um, White House pool might have 13 um, members of the press in it. There would be the wire services, you know, AP and Reuters and... Uh, and later AFP, a national newspaper, a national magazine writer at times. I'm told now that that's also sometimes referred to as the White House Correspondents Association seat. A TV correspondent, a TV camera, a TV sound, a radio reporter, still photographers from the wire services, and a national new magazine uh, news photographers. So most times when there's a, a, uh, uh, a White House event, there's some variation of that pool, particularly in the Oval Office. So could you go back to that, that uh, schematic? So, so what would happen at the White House when there was going to be, let's say, for instance, a, uh, a cabinet meeting? Um, someone in the lower press office would get on a PA system and would announce, please assemble for the uh, you know, um, tight pool coverage of the cabinet meeting. And then everyone would gather and then they would line up outside the cabinet room here and the, the aides in the lower press office would do that and at a certain point in time the doors would be open the president's sitting on this side of the cabinet room there are built-in lights inside the cabinet room the doors come open the lights go on the press would file in behind the 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 members of the cabinet and would shoot across the table at the president and uh you know, it might last for 30 seconds or so. And then a guy like me would yell, light. And then all the other press aides would say, thank you. And they would exit to the left and, and have that. That's a variation on the theme that anything that you would see in this. So if there was going to be an Oval Office pool spray, you know, the fireplace is right here. The, uh, this is the Rose Garden on the outside where you see these dots. So what would happen in, uh, in an Oval Office situation is, is that announcement would be made in the press office. There would be sliding doors on the side of the briefing room here that would open up, and the the reporters and photographers that were listed in that pool would be escorted by the press aides to the outside, to the, the colonnade out here outside the Oval Office, waiting for the event to take place, and at the appointed time, the doors would be open and they would be escorted inside. Now, also along with that pool is that a White House official photographer, the White House video crew, and the stenographer. So if the president is meeting with... Uh, a foreign chief of state or uh, you know another visitor and they have a little bit of comment or there's a, a slight give and take or a question might be answered later on in the day a transcript would be made of that the pool reporters that were inside either one of those meetings would be responsible for going back to the press office writing a pool report um, that describes what happened the who what why where and when of that that they would give to the other journalists um, if you were a radio reporter and you were recording that, your, the radio reporter would be, would be responsible for distributing the audio of that pool report 
to the uh, the other radio networks the television distributes the the video of that and that's how you know it's uh, it's done inside inside the uh, the uh, the Oval Office so uh, you know uh, finally I think what I can do is talk about the typical day at a White House so uh, in a press office um, so when I worked at the White House I would uh, I would get to the office at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, the the White House senior staff I mean I don't know how they do it now but I assume it's basically the same the White House senior staff would meet at 730 and so we would try to take a, a quick look at what was in the newspapers and what was going on that day and what the news would be so then the senior staff so Marlon could go to the senior staff meeting and they would talk about what was on the president's agenda that day and then come back and then Marlon would come back and sometimes around nine o'clock we'd have a we'd have a, a staff meeting where the 20 or so members of the the staff that that worked in the lower and upper press office and some of the support offices that I talked about would gather there and we would talk about what was going to happen that day and what was going to be happening in the next couple of days in, in terms of that and then we'd start getting ready for either White House events or the briefing that afternoon uh, in the course of the briefing we all had various assignments that Marlon would give us um, he was famous for um, having beat assignments. So there would be members of his staff that would be required to reach out for the, the, uh, the agencies. Somebody would call the Treasury Department. Somebody would call the Commerce Department. Somebody would call the Agriculture Department. Somebody would call Housing and Urban Development, um, uh, Transportation. Uh, now I guess it would be Homeland Security. All of the different cabinet departments to find out what their news was and be an early warning so he could be prepared for that. And then they would write um, guidance. These would be talking points that Marlon would be prepared to talk about in the briefing so when, when he got there so he, he could report. I think one of the reasons that the White House briefing has become so contain, contentious and difficult is there's, there's a, it has to be impossible to prepare for because you just don't know what's going to come. At least back then we had an early warning of what we thought the news was going to be and uh, what could be and we would anticipate and we would write talking points or guidance for Marlon to be able to you know answer the questions and and get to those things and that not. So a lot of the day was spent spent doing that. During the day also there would be what was called the gaggle and this was a more informal uh, meeting of reporters with with Marlon Fitzwater one of his deputies um, where where they would come to his office and there would be a give and take usually in the end of the week there was a meeting with the magazine uh, writers that were they would want to get the texture of what was happening inside the White House and and uh, you know because th the nature of their writing they needed a little bit more detail about about what was going on I uh, I, I, I want to commend something to you if you have a chance to take a look at it um, when I was researching for this piece because I haven't worked there in a long time you know and I'm sure some of the things that I've changed I think most everything's probably the same, but some of the things have changed. I, I looked on the internet and I saw this report that was written by, by Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. And it's a, a report on the office of the press secretary. And the purpose of this report was to give new press secretaries uh, the, the guidance of the people who had walked the halls before their place. So they interviewed people like Marlon Fitzwater and Mike McCurry and Roman Papaduke. Um, about their jobs and they gave their findings in a guide about what best to do it and, and I'm happy to say most of the attitudes that I share and I think what Marlon Fitzwater was shared are are, uh, are uh, enumerated in the document and uh, you know it's it, it gives me hope that future press secretaries will have a good guide for, for what to be done I, I don't think that the tone that's set at the White House these days um, you know really follows that schema but it's uh, um, you know, it's uh, encouraging to know that there is a blueprint and a plan and to know some of that. So, uh, you know, with that, boy, that's a mouthful. I could talk about this all day. Um, what I'd like to do is answer your questions now and see, uh, see what else you might like to talk about. Yes, sir. So a little bit earlier you had mentioned that you had met with the Pope. Uh, I at did. At least three times? Was well, when I said I met with the Pope. Uh, President Bush had a private audience with the Pope, and I was um, 
Um, I'll say blessed. I'm a Catholic. I was blessed to be a member of the staff and was allowed to be inside the, uh, you know, inside the private audience with the Pope as part of the president's entourage and all that. So, you know, I got to be inside the papal what apartment. What Pope was that? Uh, uh, there was two. It was John Paul and, and, uh, and the current Pope. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, earlier you mentioned that although you may not view the press as an enemy, um, many people in the government may. Um, so I was wondering how and why you believe, uh, people believe that the government has begun to view the press as an enemy. Yeah, well, I think the biggest reason these days is the President of the United States has said just recently, uh, maybe somebody knows the date, the press is the enemy of the people of the United States. I think, you know, it's being communicated from the top. And, and uh, you know, that's a, that sends a tone. If you, wa if you were an observer of what happened in the presidential campaign, that was kind of a drumbeat message that went uh, on and on. And I think some of it is stick. You know, I've talked to, uh, I talked to a, a cameraman friend of mine. I won't mention his name because I, I don't know that this was for public distribution. But he told me that recently he was, uh, he was on a stakeout on Capitol Hill. And, you know, he was just waiting to talk to a congressman. And a group of, uh, you know, visitors just came by and threw a cup of soda on him saying, fake news, which fake news are you? And, and it was being abused, you know. I, I think pe some people feel like, you know, they're, uh, they're uh, empowered to do that because it's an attitude that's being sent. I can tell you that the president that I work for, the couple of presidents that I've worked for, Ronald Reagan, you know, George Bush and George W. Bush, just didn't share that. That's not something that they would have uh, approved of. I know Marlon Fitzwater wouldn't have approved of it. And, uh, you know, it's just not how we act. A question? Um, well, you know, I learned, uh, I learned along the way. And, uh, you know, I think... Uh, um, you know, I think a certain personality archetype is is drawn to a job like this. You know, uh, um, I sometimes, you know, think that I was born to do a job like that, and uh, and I loved it. I uh, I I worked hard and I worked long hours, and and uh, you know, I was uh, I was happy to be where I was. I think the the greatest thing that you can do is to uh, uh, get really good communication skills. You know, uh, I started as a journalism student and as a reporter. And, uh, um, you know, so the thing that I would encourage you to do is, is uh, to write, you know, to write every day. Um, I think the advice that you got in your last session from the editor of the Boston Herald about, about you know, uh, becoming uh, um, multi-talented or multi-faceted journalist is good. Learn how to shoot videotape. Learn how to take still photography. Uh, you know, learn how to write, learn how to edit audio, um, uh, be a multimedia uh, communicator and taking a look at that. And then, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, if you're inclined to want to pursue maybe uh, a political career uh, as opposed to being a journalist, it's a different path. You know, uh, I have to tell you, I think once you've been a press secretary, it's difficult to go back to being a journalist and doing that. But if that's something that you're interested in pursuing, Volunteer on a campaign, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, go to look for your, your local state house or, or, uh, or mayor. Uh, you know, I started as a volunteer on local campaigns in Illinois where I grew up. And, you know, those led to exposure to people that were working on a national basis and led to me getting a, an internship and a job uh, and a career that set me up very well for a career in business later on. Um, you know, it, it was great training, my work in politics for business. And, uh, uh, I wouldn't trade what I've done in business. I love the career that I had in business after politics, but uh, uh, I, uh, I really relish the times and the people that I met with, uh, uh, um, you know, during that time, they're some of my very best friends and, and uh, very, very interesting people to be around. You know, um, um, I, I admire the acting in the West Wing. Um, it just, for me, wasn't true to life. 
you know, and so, uh, so uh, I, I, you know, really just couldn't bear to watch it because, uh, because uh, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, nobody just kind of busted in and talked to the president and said that they were outraged about something. It just didn't the way they work, you know. Uh, first off, you know, John Sununi would have dragged me up by my ear, and uh, uh, as he often did, and uh, and you know, it just wasn't possible. So, you know, uh, I know we're going to wrap up here in just a second. I just want to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, a special thanks to Marlon Fitzwater. Um, you know, uh, uh, Marlon was a, a very interesting man to work for. Um, you know, uh, when I first went to, went to work for him, I was a little bit nervous because he was the White House press secretary and I was coming from the campaign. And uh, I came to uh, like and admire him and, and uh, admire him even more now particularly for the legacy that he has in, in uh, the Fitzwater Center, the work here at, at, uh, at Franklin Pierce University, and what I think will be his lasting legacy in, in, in helping us. You know, in the last couple of days, we've talked a lot about the problems with journalism, and my charge to you is to figure out a better way to do it. I think you can be the future of journalism, and you can be the future of making... Um, you know, these situations better, you know, your intellect and your passion, the things that you can do, I, I'm sure that you can change the world. And uh, I really want to thank you for your time and having me be here.